Um, hello, everyone, and um, welcome to this webinar, The Impact of COVID-19 on the European Fish and Seafood Market. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, this webinar is organized by CBI, the Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries. Uh, we are part of the Netherlands Enterprise Agency and funded mainly by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But we also conduct uh, projects for the European Union. Uh, my name is Sanne Bogers. Um, I'm a program manager, market intelligence at CBI, responsible for the fish and seafood sector. Uh, CBI offers market intelligence on the European markets for 14 different sectors, ranging from fish and seafood to uh, apparel and tourism. Um, our market intelligence is specifically aimed at exporters from developing countries. It is free and contains a lot of tips how to best enter the European market. Um, for the fish and seafood sectors, our market research is conducted by the Seafood Trade Intelligence Portal, also called STIP. Uh, today, our market researchers, Sander Viss and Sophia Wellert, uh, we'll get you up to date on the impact the coronavirus had and has on the European market in your sector. Um, I'm really glad that so many of you are joining today. We have about 150 participants. Um, at this moment, uh, about uh, 50 are already attending and I hope the others will join soon. Uh, we have um, people registered from all over the world, including from Central America, Africa and Asia. Um, many people, especially from Indonesia and India, but also from Senegal, Honduras and Panama. Um, here in the Netherlands, it's um, four o'clock now in the afternoon, but uh, I can say uh, good morning, good afternoon and uh, good evening to you. Um, this webinar will take about 75 minutes. Uh, after my introduction, Sand and Sophia will give a presentation about uh, 45 minutes. And the PowerPoint presentation will be sent to you afterwards. After the presentation, we have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, so we probably will have to make a selection of the questions uh, that you can post uh, in the question uh, box uh, that is on your uh, control panel. Um, so, but you can, uh, this means that you can put any questions that you have during the webinar. You can put them in the question box and we as organizers will make a selection of it and uh, um, see what, what topics are of most interest to, to most of you and then answer them. Um, after the questions and before we close the session, I will give you a bit more information about the market intelligence that we offer. Um, you should be able to see the presentation on your screen. Um, so, as I mentioned before, it will be sent to you after the webinar. Um, during the webinar, um, well, well, actually, well, I would like, before we start the webinar, I uh, would like to have a kind of a poll. Um, so, we are curious to know how COVID-19 has impacted your business thus far. So, I will la launch the poll now. Um, I hope you can all see it in the screen. Um, so there are different answers that you can uh, give. It posed difficulties in the sourcing or exporting countries. It posed difficulties in the market. It doesn't have a lot of impact yet. And or it offers new opportunities. I will give a time uh, for people to answer. <laughs> Still collecting the responses. I will wait until about 70% has voted. Almost. Then I will close the poll. Okay, so from the um, sorry, can you see it now? The people uh, said 47% said it posed difficulties in the sourcing or exporting countries, 
5% has said it poses difficulties in the market. And a couple of you uh, say, say it doesn't have a lot of impact yet. And almost a third of the answers is it offers new opportunities. So that's really good to hear. I'm glad, uh, glad to hear that. Um, so I'm going to hide the poll again. Um, I'm happy that worked. <laughs> um, good. Uh, I hope uh, all is clear and the technique is also working for everyone. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know in the question box. And I wish you all a very interesting and useful webinar. And I would like now to give the floor now to Sandovich and Sophia Ballot. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Sana, for the introduction. Welcome again, everyone, to our webinar. Um, together with CBI, I am Sophia from the Seafood Trade Intelligence Portal. I am the market researcher there, and the STIP, or the Seafood Trade Intelligence Portal, is a member-based um, platform which uh, promotes and uh, focuses on the transparency and sustainability and in the seafood sector. Uh, so together with Sander, we will be trying to give you some latest uh, trends and updates, as well as what has happened in Europe in the past uh, months. And Sander? Yes, thank you very much, Sophia. And of course, thank you very much, CBI, for giving us this opportunity to explain what has happened on the on this European seafood market. My name is Sander Viss. I'm the operational manager at the Seafood Trade Intelligence Portal. I will take care of the first part of the presentation, after which uh, Sophia will uh, go to the second part. So the content of this uh, presentation, our webinar, first we have a general overview of, let's say, the normal European seafood market based on the 2019 uh, import data. Um, then we're gonna look more closely on the impact of COVID-19, both on the, on the trade and the, and the markets within Europe. Uh, after that, Sophia will take over. Well, she will uh, look at the outlooks and trends and mainly the challenges and opportunity for exporters. We were already good to see that one third voted that there are new opportunities for them. So hopefully we can uh, assist you and see where's the, where the opportunity lies. Uh, next to that, we will also focus how you can uh, stay up to date as an exporter, which is quite difficult in these challenging times of, of changes. So a general overview of the nor normal European seafood market. When we look at the seafood market, we usually uh, dive, uh, share it in, in three different markets. Europe is, is uh, three different markets. Um, and the average consumption in the whole European market is about 24.3 kilograms of fish and seafood per uh, capita. However, there's a big uh, difference between these countries. Southern Europe, France, Spain, Italy, and Portugal, here displayed in blue, we call that the southern European markets, which uh, have the highest consumption of, of uh, fish uh, up to Portugal over the 50 kilo per person per year. Furthermore, we look at uh, the green ones, which we call the nor northwestern and Nordic countries, um, both Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, the United Kingdom, but also Norway and Sweden. And next to that, we have uh, the Eastern European countries here displayed in, uh, in purple. Um, and the total import for all of Europe uh, from the developing countries is around 15.8 billion over 2019. When we look at the Southern European market, it's the, it's, uh, the biggest market uh, present uh, for exports in, uh, from developing countries, and it uh, accumulates up to 62% of the import from developing countries. The species and the products you need to think about there are squid and cuttlefish, uh, the crustaceans, shrimp, and prepared and preserved fish, such as tuna, launch, and canned tuna. And in that uh, area, uh, Ecuador and China are really important exporters towards uh, the Southern European market. When we look at the Northern European countries and the Nordic countries, uh, we see fish fillets as being important, uh, pangasius and reef fish, 
also crustaceans and prepared and preserved fish as well. Uh, the Northwestern and Nordic countries represent around 34% of imports from developing countries. When we look at to the to the Eastern European countries, there we see some Alaskan pollock and salmon fillets, mostly uh, reprocessed in China. So, uh, and also shrimp and pagasius, for instance, from Vietnam. Uh, they have a much smaller market share. Uh, Eastern Europe is responsible for just 3% of the imports from uh, developing country. However, that is uh, was growing. Um, then, of course, the impact of COVID-19. Uh, as we all know, it started in China, um, but in mid-March, the WHO declared uh, Europe as being uh, the main source, uh, the, the epicenter for the impact, um, and that uh, needed some community measures to uh, reduce the impact. And they were very different throughout Europe. So if we look at the, the measures taken, we're not going to go into uh, the details per country. But if we look at Northwestern Europe, um, it differed quite a lot per country. Uh, here in the Netherlands, we could go out shop uh, to business, uh, just business. However, restaurants were completely closed down. The whole food the service sector, including hotels, catering uh, to events, were all closed down. Um, but it differed a bit per country uh, how, how severe the, the lockdown measures were. When we look at uh, Southern Europe, um, one of the most impacted countries, um, they uh, had a full lockdown, which meant people could only go to the, uh, for necessary things outdoors. They had to stay in home. And also there, the, the restaurants, food service was completely shut down. And for Eastern Europe, the impact, as you can see in the, in the graph, it's, it's much lighter. It's, uh, the number of cases is shown there. Um, they had severe strict down lock or lockdown measures directly. So when the first uh, causes were there uh, in the big capitals, they directly shut down everything, um, uh, making sure it did not spread any further. Um, so what you see here already with the uh, with also the previous um, description of the three uh, European markets, we see that the Southern European market was hit quite hard. So what was the impact on the seafood market from this, this lockdown? Uh, basically what we can see is that uh, the impact, the uh, lockdown started from week 12, which was around mid-March. It depended a little bit per country when it was exactly, but in general, we can say from week 12 onwards, um, the, the, uh, the lockdowns or intelligence lockdowns, as some countries call them, were uh, posed. And then uh, we saw a huge drop in demand from the food service industry. Um, directly, everything was closed. It was not building off, it was directly closed. Um, and what happened, actually, people ran to the supermarket and start hoarding products. They did not know what was going to happen. Nobody knew whether there was enough supply going into supermarkets. So there was a real uh, spike in supermarket sales, which also uh, accounted for with uh, seafood sales. Uh, even some sources said that um, during March, uh, they had 50 to 60% uh, increase over March 2019 in uh, seafood sales. Um, overall, if you look at the, the sales in supermarket, it has grown 10% up to week 20 uh, compared to 2019. And then you have to imagine that the lockdown started in week 12. So in those eight to 10 weeks, there's been an, in, uh, a really increase in supermarket sales. And with that, we also saw a change in consumer behavior and consumption patterns in that sense. Uh, people looked for non-perishable products, products with life long, uh, long uh, shelf lives, such as canned products, but also pre-packed products, which they felt safer and were also easier to prepare uh, from home. Um, besides the, the measures taken in Europe, 
there were also, of course, as you might have experienced, disruptions in, within the supply chains and problems in different sourcing countries also battling the COVID-19 crisis. Um, to illustrate this, uh, we made a graph of the frozen shrimp imports from Ecuador into the European Union. Uh, this is based on UMOFA data. And what we can see is that um, in the beginning of the year, it was quite similar to 2019. Um, and then it actually increased a bit, which was mainly due that Ecuador was trying also to uh, divert its markets from China. As you know, China also had a lot of problems in the beginning of the year. So they were also directing more uh, towards exporting towards the European Union. Um, but then the gray bar you see, week 12, at that moment, the lockdown started. Um, and what is good to see here, we talk about frozen products, so they have some shipment time. We see it takes a while, up to week 17, 18, before we see the true impact of those uh, ex imports from uh, Ecuador, because uh, of course, when things are shipped out, it takes a while before they enter here. But um, you see at these last weeks from 18 onwards, it is almost zero. Um, week 24 is not yet displayed. The data is available and it's even less. So um, it both uh, showed that the demand was suddenly on hold, but also in Ecuador, um, they had some problems within their uh, country with, with battling the, the COVID. If we look a bit further on the impact on the seafood market on uh, Northwestern Europe, at the moment, what we uh, and our sources say, there is a large volume of inventory, especially in the food service sector. You've just seen the, the influx, the imports of uh, shrimp from Ecuador. They were quite high, higher in the beginning of the year than 2019. But the sales suddenly stopped. The sales to the food sector, to the retail, to the refresh segment uh, directly stopped. And that means that uh, people and importers buying in for the uh, food service sector currently just have a large inventory of stock uh, sitting there. Um, what we also saw um, that restaurants, which were closed down, they try to find other ways to earn money. Um, a lot of uh, things were invested in food deliveries and takeaway. So restaurants developed real takeaway menus and food delivery just to earn a little bit. But this is no, not uh, to compare to what they normally sell uh, and products and menus, of course. Uh, at the moment, the food service industry uh, reopens. Um, like for the Netherlands, up to uh, uh, July 1st, there's a uh, one and a half meter distancing. So uh, we have in more countries come to back to that back later. Um, and what we see that restaurants can only accommodate up to 30% of people uh, um, within their rest direct effect. And while they um, have come back a little bit, they're very, uh, still very unstable. So this also shows the effect of the, of the food service and uh, the, the imports and the COVID-19 uh, impact. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Sander, to disturb. Yeah. 
but um, we lost the audio for a moment. Um, so maybe uh, I think everybody lost it. So maybe you can um, repeat the uh, last slide um, and um, also um, try to keep a question. So if it happens again, that you can call in by phone. Thank you. Yes, I will. Okay, let's uh, let's try again. And if else, we call in by phone. Um, I will go back to the impact on the seafood market in Northwestern Europe. Uh, what we see at the moment and our sources tell us that there is a large volume of inventory uh, at the moment, especially at food service supplier. Retail, of course, could still go on. Um, and that's something as an exporter you need to be aware of that uh, there is a large in inventory uh, present. What we also saw is that restaurants try to find other ways to earn money um, with food deliveries and takeaways. Um, and that, and however, these sales were um, not near what they would normally do as a restaurant. Um, next to that, the food service industry recently reopened, um, but we still have the one and a half meter or more uh, social distancing aspect which means restaurants cannot be filled more than 30% uh, of their capacity. And for some, that's even too low uh, to open up. It costs more to open up for those 30% than it will gain in, in revenues. Um, so in that sense, uh, everything is moving again, but it, it is very slowly. Um, to give a bit of an example and background on the impact on the seafood market for Northwestern Europe. I've, we have some data on the fresh imports of a nail perch from Uganda into the European Union. What we see in the beginning of the year, uh, the imports were quite stable. Um, again, with the gray bar around week 12, uh, the COVID impact, the, the, so the community measures were taken and you see a direct decline of the imports of the fresh products. Um, and that's because, of course, the routing is different than the one from uh, Ecuador with frozen products, which takes time and therefore the effect is to be seen later. What um, we see, um, yes, they are coming back, but it's, it's um, not very stable at the moment. So this also gives a good representation of what's happened on the, on the seafood market. So if we look at Southern Europe, um, at the moment we uh, heard that retail purchases of fish uh, dropped slightly because people were looking forward to eating in restaurants again. Although there's the same, uh, restaurants are not yet opening up uh, to, the, to the max capacity. And what is uh, good to, to notice from Southern Europe, there's a, a larger focus on more pre-packed foods. Um, that could be because of safety issues, health issues that people uh, want to have the pre-packed food, but also the home consumption, of course, uh, where it's much easier to uh, use the pre-packed foods as well. Um, what we see, and that's also important for an exporter to know, I already was talking about the inventories. Uh, there are also inventories within the country of fish species which are normally exported. Um, so the government is also uh, asking people to eat more locally caught food to support the local fisheries sector. So while uh, in previous years, Times it might not be a true competition to you. Uh, please be aware that these things are uh, also still in the country of origin. Um, like I said, the food service industry also reopened there, but um, also at, with social distancing measures, um, it's going slowly. What is important to realize that uh, these countries are also big for tourism. Uh, a lot of people from Northwestern Europe, for instance, go uh, in summer holidays. They will go to uh, Spain, France and Italy. Um, but also there we hear that it's very slow, um, not even 25% of what is normal. Um, so that's, that's also uh, a concern. Um, here again, we can uh, look at the, some data 
to uh, try to get a better picture on what's happened. Uh, these are squid imports from China into the EU, uh, important product in Southern Europe. And there we see that um, even in, uh, again, from week 12 onwards, the decline uh, in the imports was shown. Um, these are also frozen products. And what you see is that these are started already at week 12. And that was mainly because uh, China also had problems uh, processing and exporting uh, in the beginning of the year as the pandemic was there. Um, uh, in their country, of course. So you see different uh, effects on, on the impact of COVID-19 on the European market. Some directly, some take a while before they uh, are there. When we look at Eastern Europe, um, also there the food service industry reopened, although the food service industry in itself is much smaller than uh, Southern Europe and Northwestern Europe. And Again, there, and that's what we see throughout Europe, there is a high demand for the individual packed products, um, but also the non-perishable products or the products with a long shelf life, which people can uh, cook easily at home, but they also feel more secured um, with hygiene measures with, uh, with the COVID. Uh, what we also hear from our sources is that in Eastern Europe, they have a lot of difficulties with logistics, uh, with freight and, and goods insurances as well. Um, so they are also struggling with internal logistics. And uh, according to some sources we spoke, they do not expect the food service industry to be back on track, uh, even this end of year or even to beginning of next year. So if we sum up the impact on seafood importers and exporters, uh, when we look at the supply chain uh, for food service, we see high inventories in the countries, both because uh, there were high exports, but also from products which are locally uh, fished or produced, which are still uh, in the core country of origin. And that makes it also sometimes challenging to sell these existing stocks, even if the market is coming up. Uh, the, the dates um, are, of course, the expiry dates, but also the organoleptic uh, features of some um, fish who contain a lot of oil might be uh, degraded a bit more. Um, another thing is the reduced processing capacity. Uh, a lot of uh, processing facilities now face, uh, especially in Southern Europe, uh, with the social distancing measure, measures, it's, uh, they cannot um, completely fill up their, um, their processing uh, units because they need to have enough space for the employees to work. Um, overall, um, the reduced liquidity and finance of especially the smaller companies who just deliver to food service uh, they have difficulty with liquidity and, and finances, um, so they might struggle uh, quite a bit in that sense. Um, then we see also some issues with uh, sourcing materials. While it looks like Europe um, on the COVID impact is going in the right direction, of course, other countries, a lot of uh, producing countries, um, are actually now facing a lot of uh, difficulties and problems with, uh, with the COVID-19 uh, virus. So also that makes it more difficult for people here to, uh, to obtain the, the materials. And what we also heard is that uh, the cost of logistics went up. Of course, there's less trade. Um, also in the future, there will be less plane flights. So um, we see the, the cost of logistics coming up. And uh, according to some of our sources, it's not expected that they will resume back to the level they were before this all happened. So expect um, both for imports and exporters, extra costs of uh, logistics. Um, an important one is uh, pricing. Um, a lot of importers, um, mainly in, in the, also in the shrimp industry, fear an oversupply. Um, harvest or stocking and harvest have been delayed, for instance, in India. Um, they fear that if that hits the market, those, uh, the harvest of that with the inventories 
uh, currently present that it will uh, make a price drop. Um, and then also the products they still have in store uh, will be devaluated, of course, uh, with that um, feeding back into the reduced liquidity and finance uh, capabilities of some companies. If we look at uh, retail, um, yeah, we've seen the increased demand and it's, uh, it seems that it will forestay for a while, of course, and that might drive temp prices up temporarily. Uh, especially as logistics uh, might be still difficult. Um, um, what we also see is that a lot of uh, processing you, uh, companies are already working on preparations for the end of year holidays, mostly the Christmas holidays in Europe, um, which normally starts around September. They already started uh, at this moment because they also have a, the reduced processing capacity. Uh, so they already want to have uh, a lot of the work done in that sense. Um, for the second part, um, the outlooks and the trends, we will switch to uh, Sophia and she will do the second part of this uh, yes. <clears throat> presentation. I will switch to Sophia. Oh, let me see. Yes. Just a moment. Shall mm -hmm. I? Mm -hmm. Is it working now? Yes, <laughs> finally. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Sorry that took some time. But hello again, and thank you, Sander, for uh, the introduction of what happened with the uh, European market. And um, in my presentation, I will cover um, the demand in seafood products, what has decreased and what has increased, and also some trends and outlook for uh, for the future, some short term and uh, Mid -term, uh, medium term as well as um, long term prospects. So uh, with the onset of the pandemic, of course, um, consumer behavior has changed, especially as the social distancing measures were um, put in place. And we saw that um, there is some varying um, changes in the behavior, especially at the beginning when there was a hoarding behavior from the consumers. So we found that uh, um, those products that have an increased demand were, for example, those that are easy to prepare, uh, convenience products. So, for example, these are the seafood mix, uh, frozen pre-packed products, canned frozen products, also canned tuna, tuna pouches, um, and things that you can use for day-to-day um, -day activities, um, such as, for example, cocktails and even barbecue, especially at this time of the year, it's summer now in Europe. So um, a lot of people are actually looking forward to, you know, spending vacations and going outside, but of course they're stuck at home. So they kind of um, want to uh, treat themselves and also elevate and experiment on their cooking and food preparation using these um, easy to uh, cook uh, seafood products. Okay, so then let's go now uh, to the products that have um, decreased in demand. So um, the biggest impact um, of the COVID-19, especially to um, um, businesses here in Europe was of course the uh, shutdown of the uh, food service sector. And with the shutdown of food service sector, there were of course less demand for um, products that usually go into that um, uh, sector to the hospitality sector. So those products are, for example, live and fresh fish and uh, crustaceans, those that are used in uh, restaurants such as uh, shellfish and brine. Uh, yeah, and also for, for people, uh, these are also products that um, are harder to prepare. So these are also um, were in less demand in terms of the retail sector. Okay, and uh, um, for those that uh, are looking to 
eat uh, or enjoy seafood still that they used to enjoy in restaurants, for example, in um, eat all you can uh, buffets such as uh, sushi bar items and like salmon and tuna. Um, there was a shift, we noticed a shift in the place of purchase. So usually they would uh, consume this in the restaurants, but now they are of course um, buying it online. So we noticed that, oh, um, like as Sander has said, that there has been pop-up of different uh, marketing strategies as well as uh, modes of delivery for um, certain seafood products. Right. So now um, we go to some of the outlooks and trends that we see uh, for the seafood industry. All right. So one of the biggest one, of course, is the impact on economy and consumer purchasing power. So uh, the European Union actually expects the GDP to reduce by 7.4% in 2020, whereas in 2019, uh, there was an average growth of 1.5%. And in the first quarter alone in, of 2020, actually the Eurozone uh, economy already declined by 3.8% while the, zooming in into particular countries, French and Spanish economies, also the biggest seafood producing nations, seafood consuming nations, also uh, shrank by 5.8% and 5.2% in the beginning of 2020. So it is quite a sign that um, you'll see that this could, uh, uh, this is the, the benchmark for what has been um, decreased so far. And in the short term, as we saw in the recent months, we saw that people, you know, want to buy luxury products and experiment on cooking and have restaurant style food in their homes. But as, as we all know, we don't have um, a, a definitive cure yet for the pandemic, for the virus. So in the long term, this may cause um, an attitude of saving instead of spending. So when this, uh, when this uh, kind of attitude sinks into consumers, of course, um, consumption in restaurants, uh, travel and luxury products are the, of course, first ones to suffer. So, um, uh, yeah, purchasing power of consumers combined with a loss of trust in Europe's economic outlook, um, of course, will have an um, impact on the on how consumers spend their money. So next one is the focus on convenience products. So before we have already discussed that uh, these products that are easy to prepare, such as pre-packed, portioned, um, such as fillets and steaks, these are the ones that are um, in demand and those products that have a longer shelf life, such as those in cans and, and jars. So you could also see an increasing amount of European companies that were used to selling fresh and whole fish uh, products um, have started to shift more in pre-packed products. All right. The next trend that we actually saw that's very interesting in the past months was uh, the direct selling. So those food services and wholesalers that uh, do not have, a, you know, that lost the demand from the uh, food service sector now also serve to retail and even directly to consumers. So as you can see here, it says from day to day, um, direct buying um, of their products. So these are offered to consumers as well. But um, this uh, kind of trend also um, shut down when the food service sector reopened because of course it's a competition in their own turf right uh, so um, along with that with the increased uh, presence of um, retailers wholesalers uh, on the internet because they want to reach out to more consumers and um, that's through delivery or online shopping and for restaurants that's uh, you know like making uh, use of takeaway menus and for online shop shopping you can see that uh, of course, the the palatability or the appealing appeal, uh, appealingness of the products are, of course, the top uh, priority when you're trying to sell online. So you can see that they are all nicely packed and all nicely um, uh, um, advertised. All right. Um, in the recent months as well, this is also one trend that we saw uh, that uh, some 
European countries are calling out for the promotion of their regional products as many people have lost their job and also um, logistics uh, difficulties have made it uh, quite uh, challenging for exporters, to, for, for the products of exporters to enter Europe. So there have been initiatives like this to uh, support the local uh, fishery in, in the country of the Netherlands, for example, or United Kingdom. And what is the takeaway from, uh, of, from all these trends? Is for you as an exporter is that there is a, a story to tell. So um, you as an exporter also experience uh, difficulties. There are real people uh, working behind the industry. Some of them may be um, your family, also your employer. So this is really a good um, opportunity to really promote um, the story behind your product. So whether it may be a story about the people, um, the catch method, for example, in terms of tuna or sustainability seals of your product, that's a story worth telling about. And um, People listen more now because people are also, you know, all the time engaged in the news, engaged online. So this is an opportunity to be able to reach out and market your stories better. All right. And as I was saying, uh, sustainability is a big part of uh, that story. And um, sustainability usually is also focused, of course, in the environment. And there are on already international um, sustainability benchmarks for that, such as MSC for wild fish, ASC for aquaculture products. But um, we have also seen now as an ex as, uh, from exporters such as in Senegal, for example, that there are um, locally led sustainability certification in initiatives. And this could be a, a quite nice uh, uh, path to take, especially if you want to prove to your importer that you are very much actively um, yeah, reaching out to them and really trying to make your products better, safer, and healthier. Um, the COVID-19 uh, crisis also has um, put in highlight the importance of taking care of our people in, 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 in during the crisis. So this uh, not only in terms of constant communication and a good, maintaining a good relationship with your importers, but also taking care of your own employees. So whether that may be employees in the um, factories or employees, uh, fishermen, for example. So these are um, all parts of the whole uh, sustainability um, uh, chain in order to, of course, in the end, profit. Okay, and this one is quite a long-term strategy of the European Union, but it is very much related to sustainability. So that's the farm to fork strategy of the EU, which will be implemented um, uh, until 2030. So the goal is to really uh, reach out to um, as many uh, businesses in Europe and also exporters to really um, be sustainable in terms of their uh, food production um, and also help mitigate climate change and adapt to its impact, especially in times of crisis and public health crisis such as these so because food security is of course a top priority in many in in many countries all right and um the, one of the last uh, things that we also noticed uh, during the pandemic is this trend of innovation and automation. Uh, these are trends that have actually already been uh, in the pipeline for, for um, in the recent years. Of course, there's investment on research and innovation, but now European companies, especially those that survived the pandemic, are looking into how to mitigate or to reduce the impact of COVID-19, whether that may be in terms of efficiency of transportation or uh, prolonging the shelf life of their products because people demand more convenient products or whether that may be in packaging so how to how do you attract consumers uh, more into um, uh, buying your your products and um, making sure that these products uh, the story of the, those products get across to the uh, consumers themselves and also another interesting um, aspect of uh, the innovation part is, of course, automation. So um, ro robot, uh, robot run companies, uh, especially Processor, they are not uh, new. They have been um, going on for a while um, in some developed countries, especially in Europe. But the, this automation might, may, might be excel accelerated because of the COVID-19. And that's because of the 1.5 meter uh, social distancing measure. So you want to um, 
protect your people as well and be more efficient uh, in uh, handling your products. And of course, with the onset of uh, more uh, robots or robotization in processing industry, there could be some change uh, in the specific buyer requirements of your importer. So for as an exporter, you can also already um, think about those lines. So whether in terms of color of your um, seafood product or in terms of size, whether they may be asking for a specific size now, if um, machines will be handling the processing. All right. Um, so before we end the presentation, uh, we wanted to give um, some take home messages. So um, it is clear that uh, the food service sector is, of course, already um, restarting and opening up again. But um, more importantly, uh, as an exporter, you have to manage your expectation because it's not going to happen overnight. And um, it will take time before the imports of seafood for food or food services are um, will go back to normal. Um, well, there may be an increase in demand uh, for seafood, especially for convenience products. It is uh, still very much early to predict whether this will be um, uh, recovering quite quickly. Um, yeah. So. Uh, and lastly, be proactive in um, developing your products, marketing them, telling the story of your products, and of course, reaching out to your um, importers. How are they doing? Um, what's the situation in their country? And how do you? How are you able to do that? That's on the next slide. So, how can you stay up to date as an exporter? So. Uh, of course, the first uh, go-tos are the industry websites on seafood, such as Undercurrent or Seafood Source for um, special COVID-19 update. You may also use Google Translate if you want to check out local websites, uh, news websites, what's happening in the country. Also check government uh, websites in order to um, know what's happening and what's the government uh, protocol for um, social distancing measure in the country. And of course, you can uh, go to CBI um, webpage. They, we have a lot of um, different uh, updates in terms of how the COVID-19 is affecting the seafood industry in Europe in general. And UMOFA um, also has bi-weekly uh, in-depth studies on different types of species. So if you're into an exporter of a specific kind of uh, seafood, you may find some um, information there that are quite in-depth. And lastly, if you're already exporting, uh, the best communication is, of course, direct communication. So uh, being in constant and direct contact with your importer is uh, really crucial in this period. Uh, check their situation. Uh, thank you all for listening. Again, um, uh, we are the Seafood Trade Intelligence Portal. We are a membership-based um, platform. We also specialize actually on shrimp. So we provide a weekly uh, shrimp price update, trade um, data analysis, um, also farm gate prices. We are in constant contact with our um, uh, sources uh, from different um, sourcing countries, as well as the market. We monitor the market developments. And if you need matchmaking or consultancy services, um, you can reach out to me as well. So. Uh, I think now I'm going to give the floor back to uh, Sana if you have some questions regarding our presentation. Yeah. Yes, well, thank you very much, uh, Sandra and Sophia, for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I hope everybody uh, found it as interesting as I did. Um, and I found it uh, really nice to see that next to the impact that uh, the crisis has on the European market, there are also some opportunities that you identified, uh, which was also coming back in the poll uh, that uh, the, the attendees uh, filled in earlier on. Um, well, uh, so it's now, to, now time for the questions and answers. Um, so this is the opportunity for uh, you, the audience, to uh, to uh, question uh, everything you want to know or you haven't heard yet uh, to Sandra and Sophia, and uh, please use the question box uh, to do so. And I will uh, um, see which questions are coming in and uh, post them to uh, Sandra and Sophia. Yeah. Maybe in the meantime, uh, it's interesting to also uh, look in a little bit in the future. Of course, uh -huh. people are talking about uh, the second wave coming uh, to Europe. Um, whether that's going to be there, uh, nobody knows, of course. Uh, 
Um, but uh, I think the, the government is taking quite uh, good measurements and, and strict um, insights in what's happening on the market um, or on the COVID crisis. So um, I think the, the impact of a second uh, wave will not be as big as the first wave when it all basically startled us. Uh, nobody knew what to do. Um, and I see uh, some questions already coming in at the moment, so we can uh, focus on that as well. Yes, uh, we are indeed getting some questions in. Um, let me see. Um... Yeah. Okay. One of the questions is um, when you say retail market, uh, which pack size? Uh, single serve, family pack, or both? Um, mm. Sandra, I do you... I can... Yes, Sophie. Uh, yeah. Maybe I can take this one then. Um, so yeah, in the in terms of retail, we see uh, a demand actually for both types of products. So as we said before, there is a demand for um, filleted products that are um, served single, especially for retail. But at the same time, as you saw on the presentation previously, that there have been um, attempts to also sell um, boxes in uh, like big ones so in in those kinds of family packs that you have uh, said those are for example um kind of uh, uh, a combination of different products uh, combined in one uh, fish box they say um but indeed in the retail market you would see a lot of um yeah single packed um uh, products also um yeah canned uh, products that are um served in a single uh yeah in single um uh Dance. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to add to that, Sander? Or no. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, Sophia. Um, then no. one of the other questions um, is: uh, What are some of your recommendations on building the stories around our brands and products, especially when we are trying to position a new region, for example, Central America, as a supplier of fish and seafood? Sophia, yeah. do you want to uh, okay. research <laughs> yes. on, the, on the branding right. and the products? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think um, as I've, I've as I've told you earlier, there are in the in the stories are very important. And um, uh, in Central America, for example, I will just take for example Ecuador uh, in terms of their shrimp story. So they're trying to package their products um, as the, the the most sustainable shrimp. And in order to do so, they are focusing on different aspects so uh, first is the sustainability of their shrimp products also the health benefits of um, of uh, the shrimp products so in in terms of telling a story I think one of the best ways to market your products is to uh, uh, see like put a face behind it so usually when we we, we did like a whole uh, uh, magazine on it how to market uh, uh, shrimp in particular uh, because we are uh, focused on shrimp but in terms in, in general in marketing seafood you should always put a, a face behind your product so whether that may be a consumer or um, child growing up wanting to eat more seafood and there are various campaigns uh, on this in in the U.S. alone, for example, there have been campaigns on how to um, encourage uh, children how to eat seafood. And in Europe, as you know, Europe is very much into the sustainability uh, part of uh, uh, seafood. So indeed, like it, how you fish your fish, how, how you fish your uh, seafood, um, how you process your seafood, how, how you take care of the people within the seafood industry, uh, they are very much... Uh, uh, very much interesting stories that are, are worth telling about. So I think um, these are the major impacts and also health. Uh, seafood is healthy. So seafood, uh, seafood can uh, be quite an interesting um, uh, way to spice up your food. And a lot of people now are uh, experimenting on different types of recipes and uh, um, cooking skills. So it's, it's, uh, it's the perfect, perfect opportunity to market seafood as the healthy, really um, appealing, really nice uh, meal for family, for the family inside their homes.
Thank you very much, uh, Sophia, for your elaborate answer. Um, okay, one of the other questions is um, on uh, the future of um, cheap, cheaper seafood. Do you think that product will be more sellable in the near future? Um, yeah, that, that's of course uh, a, a quite a broad question in, in that sense. Um, when we talk about cheaper products in, in this, I would say then you also have uh, different products. Um, and whether the, the market is open for that, it, it depends a bit on, on what kind of products they are, of course. Um, we see uh, for cheaper fish products that there is a lot of competition uh, between products and they are bought on price. Um, on the other hand, we saw already what Sophia was explaining that, uh, for instance, luxury products, uh, the, the high valued products, uh, that demand uh, will not go away. Although um, if restaurants cannot open, then uh, they cannot sell it. But the demand for those kind of products will be there, um, but they might be in a different uh, situation. So. Um, I don't think necessarily that uh, seafood products in general will become or need to become much cheaper to uh, to sell. Um, but of course, they are always uh, for a lot of people also compared to the meat industry to meat products in that sense. And then there's a long way to go. But uh, I think people are willing to pay a little bit more sometimes for uh, for seafood products in general. Uh, so yeah, it's um, it, it's uh, yeah, that's basically it. Maybe Sophia needs have some additions to it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Um, seems uh, Sophia has no additions. Um, then there are a couple of questions on uh, the swim market. Um, so one of the questions is uh, which market in the EU will rebound first for swims and other questions are related to uh, the future of Indian swims. Uh, so what is your take about Indian swim exports to Europe this year and next year? Um, yeah, it depends of course a, a little bit um, whether we look at the retail sector or the, the food service sector. The food service sector, as we said, it will take time before uh, it, it comes back to um, things. What we think, um, it might not be the, the uh, amount, which is much less, but the prices the, uh, that we said, like India is producing at the moment or it's going to harvest around September. Um, so the harvest of of, uh, of that will uh, suppress prices in that sense. If prices are low enough, uh, importers might buy and uh, build up stock for the for the holiday season. Um, if near the end of the year the demand in increases again, then they have bought uh, 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 cheap products. Um, which market in the EU will rebound for, first for shrimp? Uh, I think at still at that uh, we still need to look at the southern european market um, that is just the biggest market for for seafood products uh, people are tend to eat that much uh, quicker in that sense uh, they they it's it's really part of their their nutritional uh, diet in that sense so um, of course but it will go slowly but i think southern europe will be one of the ones uh, when everything starts going again uh, will pick up uh, the demand uh, as first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much again. Um, let me see. One of the other questions is about trade fairs. Um, so, do you will there be any alternatives for trade fairs? Um, are there? Do you think about online trade fairs or business to business meetings? Or um, do you expect trade fairs to uh, to happen again soon uh, in the fall, for example? Yeah, I think uh, at the moment, as far as I know, the the Consumar is the first one uh, which is still not cancelled in that sense, and they are trying to uh, have the measures in place there. And of course, the seafood market is is just based on on 
interpersonal relations and, and trust. So you do want to meet your people there. So if it's possible there, uh, I would go there because of course, like uh, the Brussels show uh, got canceled that we will take a couple of time before that's back uh, in Barcelona. Um, alternative, um, I know for instance, the goal, um, it's a bit more, uh, it's from the GAA. Um, they would have uh, an affair or a conference in, in Tokyo that's been canceled, but they will move to an online um, uh, conference in that sense. So try also to participate in those things, already have connections. Um, and if you already have connections, just try to keep in touch with them, as we said before. Um, so yeah, some will move to alternative like the online, but I expect some of them after summer, when we have a better uh, picture of what's happening, how the, also the spread of COVID is going, uh, that some uh, trade fairs will uh, regain, but with social distancing control. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, then there are some other questions, and one of them is: um, Do you see uh, the uh, increasing demand for online shopping in the seafood sector? I think this is also something that came back in your presentation already. Uh, yeah. Unmute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, in the so as we saw that there's a what what we are actually now seeing that is there an actual increase in online sales and what we are we are also expecting is that the good trends will actually remain in the in the in light of this covid crisis so of course like those things one of the things that actually a lot of seafood companies lack um is their online presence so a lot of them are only realizing that oh there's there's actually tons of people that are do going online now and many of them have actually just started for example their online delivery services or their facebook or instagram accounts i really also personally i've um i've uh, i've observed um more active um, campaigns especially marketing campaigns online so um if the good trends will remain i think one of those uh, good trends is indeed um online shopping and um if for example as nobody could see now yet uh whether the the covid 19 crisis will end soon so in in the short term and the midterm uh, medium ther term i think that indeed online shopping will remain since it's a it's a good um alternative delivery mode and also marketing uh, um, uh, marketing w pr um, strategy in order to reach the consumers directly and um, as more people are still a lot of people are still unable to really move around and really go shopping and even though um, restrictions have been lifted many people are still very much um, scared or uh, hesitant to really um, go into the supermarkets, really uh, socialize. So I think indeed one of the uh, trends that will remain strong or even be more uh, focused on is uh, online marketing and sales. Yes. Thank you again, uh, Sophia. Um, there are quite a number of questions, uh, more questions uh, that came in. Um, I'm afraid we cannot answer them uh, all, but um, I su suggest that we can uh, try to answer them uh, by email if we haven't uh, had the chance to, uh, to answer them during this webinar. Uh, one of the questions that, uh, that we will try to answer uh, still is, uh, do you think that seafood buyers, specifically swim buyers, will become more relaxed about certification requirements given the effect of COVID-19? Um, no, <laughs> actually. Sorry, Sandra, you're on mute. You're muted. <laughs> you have to unmute yourself yes, and try and start again. <laughs> Yes, uh, basically my answer to that is if they already are um, requiring certain certifications, they will not loosen that up. 
um, especially in the retail sector, um, A ASC, MSC, all those kinds of uh, certification are basically a license to sell and a license to produce. Um, actually, what I think that uh, also what was Sophia was explaining that the demand for these kind of certifications programs on sustainability, but also on social uh, security, um, even become more and more um, present. Uh, that's why we also gave the tip, like, if you um, look within your country, whether you can start developing a local um, sustainability certification, if you cannot yet meet these kind of requirements, but then you already show that you are investing, willing to invest and taking the time and effort uh, to work towards these certifications. But in Europe, we just see um, the continuous uh, increase of the demand for these kind of uh, certified products in that sense. Uh, started in Northwestern Europe, uh, Southern Europe is also coming up, uh, as well as Eastern Europe, we also got uh, in information that that will also grow. So um, if you cannot directly de um, have the, the ASC, the MSCs, you might want to invest some time at the moment if you have it, um, in the, with the, some starting some local schemes up. Um, and from there is the first step towards uh, a broader certification. Um, thank you yes. very much again, uh, Sander and Sophia. Um, I think we close the uh, question and answer uh, answers now. Um, and we will have a look at the outstanding questions uh, or that does not, uh, have not been answered yet and see if we can answer them uh, shortly by email uh, to the people who post them. Um, then, um, yeah, I would like to uh, to tell a little bit more to you uh, all, um, yeah, uh, that about the uh, market intelligence that CBI offers. Um, so, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we offer free market uh, research for different sectors, including the fish and seafood sectors, and it's specifically aimed at exports from developing countries. And um, so, also, um, yeah, if if you have any other questions that you haven't been able to pose in this uh, in this uh, webinar, uh, you might also find answer there because we have market studies looking at the demand for your products, also about uh, market studies about the trends on the European market, uh, what, do, what buyer requirements do they need to fulfill. Uh, for example, we have quite some information about uh, MSC and ASC certification. Uh, also, we have studies with tips how to find buyers in the European market, uh, how to do business in Europe, um, and also a study providing tips on how to organize your uh, exports more practically speaking. Uh, we have studies concerning the whole fish and seafood sector, but also studies uh, on specific spe species uh, like tuna or different types of shrimp. Um, last but not least, I would like to mention that uh, this week we published a study written by one of our uh, fish and seafood experts. And it gives an advice uh, to exporters from developing countries on how to deal with COVID-19 in the fish and seafood sector and what you should do at this moment to maintain your business and what you can do to prepare your business for the changed reality. So I think that's a really good uh, tip for you all to, uh, to look at that study. And in order to stay up to date uh, on our latest publications, uh, you can sign up for our market um, intelligence newsletter um, and you can find up uh, how, uh, find out how to sign up on our website uh, which is uh, www.cbi.eu slash market dash information slash fish seafood um, okay well then we have come at uh, the end of this webinar uh, I would like to thank you, uh, our audience, uh, for attending to this webinar. Um, well, this was one of the first uh, webinars we organized, um, so therefore it's specifically uh, important um, to let us know how uh, you think about this webinar, has it been useful to you, if you do you have any feedback to us. Um, so um, once um, this uh, webinar ends, uh, there comes a survey Please uh, fill that in and um, let us know how you think uh, about it. 
Then uh, on behalf of CBI, um, I wish you and your businesses all the very best and thank you for your time. Goodbye.